Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everybody and uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon via Zoom. I'm, I think we're all just amazed at how many, how many more people we can accommodate um, via Zoom these days than uh, if we're all traveling and have other things to do. So it's, it's great to see the turnout. Thanks uh, for being here. I hope everybody had a great summer um, and are energized uh, for the fall term as I am. Uh, our virtual PLUS campus is in full swing and I do look forward to the rich and engaging experiences that um, as we gather as a community to provide, really I think it's, it's a different and, and truly an exceptional educational experience uh, for our students. And we are committed more than ever to prepare them for the public health challenges they're facing now that we are all facing now and in the future. So it'll be an exciting um, couple of terms and we appreciate all the, the work uh, you have done to make this happen. So I'd like to begin my introduction of our speaker today by conveying the significance of being appointed or promoted to the rank of professor at the Bloomberg School. Earning the rank of professor represents an incredible achievement and confirms not only the respect and high regard of the school but also of colleagues uh, from across the nation and throughout the world. Designed to introduce uh, the Hopkins community to the work of newly appointed and promoted professors, this Dean's Lecture Series provides a forum to promote the interchange of interdepartmental awareness and collaboration. So I'm pleased today to introduce um, our speaker. Not only is he a professor, but he is the 40th Bloomberg Distinguished Professor of Health Economics at Johns Hopkins University, Dr. Dan Polsky. Dr. Polsky is a national leader in the field of health policy and economics and has dedicated his career to exploring how healthcare is organized, managed, financed, and delivered, especially for low income and vulnerable populations. His research has advanced our understanding of the cost and quality trade off of programs and policies, whether they include changes to large federal programs or policies or um, local programs. He holds primary appointments in both the Department of Health Policy and Management here at the school, as well as the Cary Business School, with a joint appointment in the School of Nursing. He is also the founding director of the Hopkins Business of Health Initiative, which he'll tell us more about today. Before coming to Hopkins in 2019, Dan was on the faculty at the University of Pennsylvania where he was the Robert D. Eilers Professor at the Wharton School and, and um, was also faculty of the Perelman School of Medicine. And from 2012 to 2019, he served as Executive Director of the Leonard Davis Institute for Health Economics. Dan is a member of the National Academy of Medicine and serves on the Health and Medicine Committee for the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine. He also serves on the Congressional Budget Office's Panel of Health Advisors and was the Senior Economist on Health uh, Issues at the President's Council of Economic Advisors. Dan received a Master of Public Policy degree from the University of Michigan in 1989 and a PhD in Economics from the University of Pennsylvania in 1996. He is joined today um, by his colleague, uh, Dr. Aditi Sen, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Health Policy and Management. Dr. Sen will facilitate the Q&A session following the talk. And I will um, uh, use this opportunity to remind you that if you do have a question to ask of uh, Dr. Polsky, it would probably be best if you posted that in the Q&A uh, chat um, on Zoom. So um, with that, I am delighted to welcome Professor uh, Bloomberg Distinguished Professor Dan Polsky. We look forward to your remarks. Dan? Uh, thank you so much. Um, it's really just a delight to have a chance to, you know, ad address the school. Uh, even if I can't uh, physically see you, uh, I know you must be on the other side of uh, this, this Zoom chat. And, and thank you, Alan, for, for such uh, kind remarks. And um, also just you know, for the vision for the school, I think a big part of me making this move uh, was uh, you uh, at the helm uh, and Colleen as a department chair and, and the vision that, that the two of you have kind of set forth has given me a lot of excitement about, um, you know, what, uh, what lies ahead here in the school and the department throughout the university. It's just uh, been a great year and a half. And, um, you know, thank you for all of your support along the way. 
Um, just very grateful for that. Um, and, you know, along with uh, Colleen as well and, and, and Josh Sharfstein, I think the three of you really, you know, sealed the deal for me to make the move. So grateful for that. And also very grateful to my colleague, uh, DT Sen, for agreeing to man the Q&A. Uh, we share a very similar biography. We both were at the Council of Economic Advisors at the same time. We were both in, uh, at Wharton at the same time. And uh, she came here to Hopkins first. So uh, she also deserves a lot of um, credit or blame for me now uh, being at Hopkins. So, but thank you, uh, Aditi, for um, uh, working with me today uh, to, to man the chat. So, and also a thank you to everyone in the audience for attending. Just have been uh, just been overwhelmed by the family here at Hopkins and being so quickly made a member of this family. Um, just uh, really grateful for so many dear colleagues. I hope many of you are in the audience. I'll give a wave. Hi, everybody. Um, and uh, just just thank you for being here. So um, I'm gonna start to dive in here and share my screen. Uh, wish me luck on this here. Okay, I think that worked. Um, if uh, anything's going wrong, uh, Aditi Allen can tell me. But um, so the talk today, health insurance in the U.S., uh, which uh, my subtitle there, facilitator and barrier for healthcare access. So just a little bit of kind of what brought me to this topic today and, and, and what I'm going to do. So, you know, my first uh, love, I guess, uh, was policy. Um, I did a master's, as, as Ellen said, in public policy, um, attached to my undergrad and went to Washington um, and, uh, you know, got, you know, also interested very much in economics as a tool for addressing policy. And really, you know, kind of health came uh, third, I guess. Um, and this uh, opportunity to uh, think more about health insurance, I think once I got into the healthcare field, I started with more micro issues, but spending a year in Washington, I guess it was uh, 07, 08, uh, really made me think much more about macro issues in healthcare. I think I, I never thought of um, health insurance as the topic I would study whenever I teach healthcare and the healthcare system. I say, you know, I'm sorry you did not sign up for a class on health insurance, but it was titled health insurance, nobody would sign up. Um, but so much of healthcare involves health insurance and really to really move uh, um, the healthcare system in major ways, it's kind of attached to everything. So that's really what's brought me to this uh, topic today. And so the goal here is um, to just give you a little flavor. I guess I'm showing a lot of results for uh, like tons of pieces of papers, but I'm gonna try to tie them together thematically just to give you a sense of what I do and not get too like deep into the methods here. So we'll see how it goes. So. Uh, let's see if I can even advance the slide. So uh, the motivation here for the talk uh, it's kind of came from an article I read this morning uh, in the New York Times. Um, coronavirus tests are supposed to be free. The surprise bills come anyway um, by uh, uh, Sarah Cliff. And uh, so hopefully this doesn't give away when I started preparing for this talk, um, but I think it kind of ties together uh, what I'm going to talk about um, today. So just to summarize, you know, the messaging, the testing is free has been very clear. Our leadership, Seema Verma, was quoted as saying, it is critical that Americans have peace of mind, knowing that costs won't be a barrier to testing during this national public health emergency. Congress passed laws requiring insurers to pay for tests, and the Trump administration created a program to cover the bills for the uninsured. Um, cities and states set up no-cost testing sites, on and on. But uh, as uh, you know, Sarah Cliff goes on to describe in the article, surprise bills persist. Um, some in the thousands of dollars for people get tests and think they're free. Um, and you know, uh, analysis has shown that like 2.5 percent nearly of uh, coronavirus tests billed to insurers leave the patient responsible for a portion of the bill. So there's a real messaging issue here, and a lot of it comes from gray areas in the federal law. Federal law requires insurers to pay for any doctor visit associated with a coronavirus test, but it's silent, however, on how much an insurer must pay for an out-of-network facility. Um, so what message does this deliver? Will folks be afraid to get tested? And how does this apply to what's coming next? Vaccines. Um, and so the question I've been thinking quite a bit about 
is uh, can we rely on insurance to, um, to ensure adequate uptake of COVID-19 vaccines? I'm part of a uh, uh, National Academies of um, Medicine, Science, Engineering and Medicine um, committee now. It's called the Framework for Equitable Allocation of Vaccine for the, corona, the Novel Coronavirus. Basically, I spend uh, six to eight hours on Zoom calls every week, trying to write a report over the next, uh, over two months. Uh, next week, our final thing is due. So um, that, uh, I need your help. A um, lot of what we've talked about um, on our Zoom calls, I can't share with you, but we have a report, a draft report that's out. We've received 1,400 comments from our draft report last week. We're busy uh, responding to them and writing the second half of our, of our report. But in that first half of the report, we really spent a lot of time thinking about the ethical framework, uh, what, the, uh, what the different, um, uh, you know, who comes first, who comes second, we're like prioritizing who's gonna get the vaccine when it's uh, very, um, in the early months. Um, but a key part of making sure the vaccine gets distributed in an um, equitable way won't be just based on our criteria that we set up. It's going to be based on insurance. Um, so I guess the question for you all, and I'd like you to help me uh, think about this a little bit, is um, how health insurance coverage acts as, acts as both a facilitator and barrier to executing on the, any framework we might come up with around an equitable distribution of, uh, of the vaccine. So just a little background on the vaccine. As many of you are following this in the news, I'm sure, but there are five candidate vaccines now in late stage clinical trials. Um, emergency use authorization may lead to some doses hitting the market before the end of the year uh, with a projected rapid rise in the availability of vaccines in the first quarter of next year. The reports out that the cost will be four to $20 per dose that are kind of connected to these purchase agreements between federal from federal investment and vaccine development. Many of these trials uh, suggest that there are gonna be two doses of vaccines needed. Um, and so even if you add a, up two doses, this cost of up to $20 is still less than a typical flu vaccine. Um, but you know, if the doses are needed annually, then what might happen for these costs over the long run are really unclear, this four to twenty dollars, it could end up being more. We're just there's so much we're uncertain about. So, what about costs for the um, for the person that's getting the vaccine? A COVID-19 vaccine um, would have to be recommended by the uh, US Preventive Health Services Task Force uh, and the ACIP before it would be covered at no cost. And once this happens, health plans would have 15 days to start covering it. This is down from the usual one to two years for these kinds of preventive services in the um, uh, regulations that were set forth from the ACA. And this came from the CARES Act, which is passed in Congress in March um, to kind of allow for this uh, for vaccines. But again, like testing, the messaging pretty much has been that it will be free um, to, to people getting the vaccine, but ultimately the devil's in the details. Um, and addressing these e details could not be more important. Majority of the prioritized populations have limited incomes. Minimizing cost barriers will help allocate vaccines to the most vulnerable. Uh, making significant progress towards achieving herd immunity will require high vaccination rates, not only among people for whom costs are prohibitive, but also among people who are not, don't perceive a large personal gain from the vaccine. They may pose great risk to others if they remain unvaccinated. This um, externality problem, motivating them through insurance could also be very important even for that group as well. So, okay, I spent 15 minutes on my motivation. Time to dive into my talk. Um, I'm gonna cover, uh, so back to kind of my theme here, health insurance, a facilitator and barrier for healthcare access. I'm gonna talk about four areas of my research and they all relate to this question of vaccines. Um, number one that I'm gonna talk about is insurance matters. Insurance increases access to care, lower costs uh, at the point of purchase, increased utilization. So I'll talk about some papers that were about uh, 10 or so years ago. Um, cost sharing matters. Uh, reducing, eliminating out-of-pocket costs for preventive services can increase utilization. We'll talk about incentives within insurance on papers that I did uh, in, in 2015. 
and move on to more recent research talking about provider networks. And the theme there is provider networks involve trade-offs. Using health insurance can be confusing, mistakes can be costly as pointed out by Sarah Cliff. Um, and so understanding provider networks is an important part of addressing some of the potential barriers from health insurance for vaccines. And number four is we can't forget about reimbursement. Insurance does not reimburse enough for services uh, that are delivering high public health value, such as vaccine administration, care may ultimately be underprovided. So before I move on, I'm just going to kind of break the fourth wall here because, I'm, you know, we're all here on Zoom, we're working from home. I got this green screen, three kids running around, and my daughter loves to um, come up when I'm taping for like class. So just to avoid any embarrassment, there's a picture of Stella who loves to come up in my green screen and, and, and surprise me um, while I'm teaching. So in case she does, we've already kind of broken the ice. Um, okay, so back to my talk, we have four things to cover here. Number one, um, insurance matters. So this first study is not my study, it's much more famous than my work. It's the Oregon Health Study. Uh, which uh, used uh, kind of the, a randomization opportunity in Oregon. I'm sure you're, most of you are familiar with it um, to show how uh, uh, gaining Medicaid when you're probably uninsured prior um, can change uh, how much health care you get and potentially your health downstream. And this slide here is preventive care. And it shows a jump, a large jump in the utilization of preventive care from getting insurance. And it's mostly tied to lower costs at the point of purchase, but certainly there are other aspects of insurance that really um, encourage access to care. Um, uh, you know, notably, they were not able to show uh, um, uh, kind of an overall population health effect in, 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 in their overall results, although they did show an improvement in um, self-reported health status. My less famous work in this area, I have uh, two papers from uh, about 10 years ago one was in health services research that really used the, um, the opportunity of gaining insurance when you're 65 to try to understand what gaining insurance means, particularly for people who are uninsured prior to turning 65. So it turns out that you get, a, you get on Medicare. Um, it, it, it does improve your self-reported health status, but it does so for both people who are previously uninsured and people who were insured. So it's that kind of stability of getting onto Medicare that can impact self-reported health. But we weren't, again, you know, similar to the Oregon study, we weren't able to detect um, notable differences between the insured and uninsured. So then we had a follow-up study in health economics um, that again tries to take advantage of, you know, what we learned from turning 65. Um, and here, uh, both of these studies involve linking survey data to um, health insurance claims data sets, which is kind of a common theme throughout a lot of my, my work. Um, but in this study, we look at the pattern of health service use, and it turns out that while you use more health services if you were previously uninsured, you don't change kind of the, the mix or how you use health services. So you might not extract the value from the healthcare system based on the way you've learned to interact with the health system while being uninsured. So for example, you're more likely to go to the hospital relative to you know, a huge jump in say seeing your primary care doctor, things like that. So, um, that there's, a, there's kind of a behavior change that's needed outside of just you know, giving you a paper that says you're insured. And so some of these um, kind of muted health findings uh, might be related to some of that uh, behavioral response. Um, so, you know, so this made me, um, you know, this work made me think a little bit more about, you know, kind of what to do next, right? So health insurance matters, but, you know, again, like the, the devil's in the details. So one of the details is, um, is cost sharing. So how you're incentivized once you have insurance to, to, to use health services at the point of purchase. So uh, again, connecting back to COVID-19, um, there was a, a, a regulation in the ACA that uh, eliminated out-of-pocket costs for preventive services. Um, this was, uh, uh, the idea is that this can increase utilization as the rationale behind this regulation and just, uh, uh, the, the, the details is a preventive service um, that has strong scientific evidence of their health benefits must be covered. Plans can no longer charge a patient a co-payment, co-insurance, or deductible for these services when they are delivered by a network provider. 
As a result, through the ACA, people with health insurance, with few exceptions, have no cost sharing for vaccines recommended by ACIP. And as I, me as I mentioned, um, uh, the, the CARES Act added, uh, you know, a COVID-19 vaccine, you know, should be added within these, the kind of, a, you know, umbrella of this regulation within 15 days of its uh, emergency approval. Um, so I just want to, you know, take a brief moment, uh, since this is such an important part of what's uh, happening with vaccines, tied some of my work that demonstrated the impact of the regulation here from uh, 2010 on uh, utilization, uh, or uh, I guess on out-of-pocket costs and utilization. So first was this paper in Health Affairs um, in 2015, I think. So women saw large out-of-pocket decrease in out-of-pocket spending for contraceptives after the ACA mandate um, removed cost sharing. So, you know, like most health affairs studies, the entire study is summarized in the title. So I don't have much else to say. We looked at 10 years of claims data to study this and we saw a large decline in out-of-pocket costs. It turns out that out-of-pocket costs for IUDs are, are quite high before. So um, this reduction out-of-pocket costs did stimulate an increase in utilization for IUD services. Um, but overall, preventive care for contraceptives did not increase markedly um, as a result of this regulation. We saw the same thing in this uh, other 2015 study where we look at a lot of other um, mandated preventive screening services. Um, what's shown here in this chart is colonoscopy. Um, and you can see that uh, the um, out-of-pocket costs dropped dramatically with the slide on the left. The slide on the right looks at utilization of uh, colonoscopies and we didn't really see any decline. So you notice in this study, as well as in the other, there are two lines that uh, kind of, um, that are uh, after the policy takes effect, which is that vertical line. Uh, the blue line represents plans that, uh, where the policy did not, or not, I should say the purple line, where the policy did not take effect. And they're called grandfathered plans. So these regulations only apply to kind of newly um, initiated plans. And this gets a little bit to some of the shades of gray. All right, so the ACA requirements do not apply to many health insurance products, including short-term plans that are pr promoted now by the Trump administration, healthcare sharing ministry plans, these grandfathered plans, which uh, I just uh, discussed, Farm Bureau plans. Um, so paying attention to uh, these, these shades of gray are important. Not all eligibility groups in Medicaid are covered under this regulation. It covered the new eligibility groups from the ACA, but not the previous groups such as pregnant women, minor children, adults with disabilities, and the elderly. And even plans where the ACA requirements do apply, situations arise in which patients are billed, which could sow distrust. Um, for example, if the vaccine is delivered during an office visit that is not exclusively pre for preventive care, um, for example, patient's medical issues discussed, the visit could be billed as a diagnostic visit and cost sharing would apply. Also, if the vaccines are administered by an out-of-network provider, the zero cost sharing requirement would not be applicable. Um, and this brings me to point number three, um, which is around networks. But I want to divert a bit and talk more broadly about provider networks, as this has been a thrust of uh, much of my research in recent years. But I will uh, get back to the COVID-19. Uh, vaccine issue. Um, and the main theme of this one is provider networks involve trade-offs. And a lot of economics, a lot of what I cover involves uh, trade-offs. And it often leaves people uh, wanting a, a single answer. Um, and I just want to lay out the trade-offs. So uh, with this slide, it's impossible to really understand what I'm, I'm, I'm getting at here. But what, uh, what we've done uh, here is mapped out for an entire insurance market, uh, which is the ACA marketplace. Uh, we looked at every uh, plan offered in the marketplace and counted up the number of providers that uh, are in the plan network um, for the plan provided and in relation to the number of providers, or I should say physicians, that are in that same geographic area in which the plan is sold. And the blue lines at the bottom about 21% overall, uh, suggests that 21% of plans um, have networks that are extra small, so less than 10% of providers in a marketplace are offered in a plan. 
The next group, 26%, uh, brings you almost, uh, pretty much up to 50% of plans have less than 25% of providers in the marketplace. And, and it moves on up. So there's a, still a good portion of plan where they're, 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 they're very broad. They have like 60 or more percent of the, uh, of the physicians in the market available for the people who have that plan. And this is just to point out that there's incredible variability. And so when we think about the COVID uh, vaccine, um, you know, different people are gonna be in different circumstances. And the people that are more likely to be in the narrow network plans are often people that are much more price sensitive because it turns out that, um, that narrow network plans are less expensive. Uh, the premiums are lower. Um, and so that, that's what this graph shows. And I've had a couple papers that have kind of uh, uh, demonstrated this, that uh, you can save uh, about um, up to 10% of your premiums. Our premiums can be up to you know, six to 10% lower when you select plans that are, um, that are narrow, that are kind of at the narrowest on the spectrum versus the broadest on the spectrum. And this is true for, uh, on the left, we have physician networks, but it's also true for the breadth of the hospital networks that are in these plans. Um, and I guess just one notable point about um, this research, I'm just gonna skip back for a second, is to get to the point where we're measuring uh, network size, what we did is we went to every, there are about 500 plans being sold in the marketplace. And we went to these, uh, the find a doctor website that you might go to when you're looking for your provider. And we uh, you know, used web scraping to type every zip code into every find a provider network and pulled off 25 million lines of code of uh, providers, cleaned it up uh, to create this database. Um, so fortunately from that work, it was a proof of concept. Now there are companies that do this. Um, and also there are regulations by the federal government that um, now make these uh, find a doctor um, lists uh, machine readable so that it becomes a lot easier to do this kind of research. Um, but I like to think that um, it was, it was our uh, scraping effort way back, uh, you know, about eight or eight years ago that, that uh, helped to um, bring this type of transparency to provider networks um, that we see today. Um, so in this issue of trade-offs uh, for, for networks, so are networks good or bad? So, you know, they may be cheaper, but like it, it stinks to like, have a plan with a narrow network. Nobody likes it. Um, and, and part of the reason is health insurance can be confusing, mistakes can be costly, and it's just amplified when you have a narrow network, right? So there's this uh, issue that's been in the news quite a bit the past few years about balance billing and surprise billing. And it's just more common if you have a narrow network. And if you're just, if all your doctors are covered, then it doesn't matter if you make a mistake and, and mistakes are common. Um, so, so people tend to not like these narrow network plans and also you just have less choice. And, and if uh, you may not actually find the doctor you need if you have a very narrow network. Um, and you get sick with a, a condition that involves a, a provider that may not be a plentiful to begin with. And finally, as this uh, you know, chart shows in another paper, just kind of you know, uh, part of the tour through, through uh, lots of uh, research that I've been a part of, um, this one shows that uh, narrow networks, so we looked at cancer uh, care, and we looked at physicians that deliver um, oncolo oncological services, that um, Narrow network plans are more likely to uh, seek out uh, physicians that aren't part of NCI cancer centers. So it's kind of our measure of kind of quality providers. So there does seem to be a relationship between uh, the quality of the providers in a network and its size. Um, so uh, uh, this, this, I, this idea of trade-offs, um, I'd like to make three points from this 2008 health affairs study. Uh, what we see here uh, are three bars under this uh, line. It says uh, in-network rate. So what this measures is for um, employer-sponsored health insurance, which is the darkest line, marketplace um, health insurance market segment, and Medicaid market segment. It measures uh, the likelihood of finding a provider if you accepted a plan um, in one of these health insurance markets, right? So market uh, so uh, networks are generally smaller for market, if you're, in the, if you're buying an ins insurance in the healthcare marketplace versus you get your insurance from Johns Hopkins and your employer-sponsored health insurance. And it's even smaller in Medicaid. And then the three bars on the right suggest that even if you go to a provider that is in network, 
you're increasingly less likely to be able to find an appointment with that provider. If you're in Medicaid versus um, the marketplace, a market segment versus uh, employer-sponsored health insurance. So the first point I'd like to make is that, uh, you know, insurance market segments that are aimed at lower income populations, just as Medicaid and marketplace populations, um, you have less choice, networks are narrower. Um, and second, among the subset of providers um, that are in network, it's even harder to get an appointment. So, and th this gets to something I'll talk about a little bit later, typically reimbursement rates are lower um, in these market segments and, and, and physicians might be rather to, to, might be more likely to see um, patients that where they'll get a, a higher return um, in terms of reimbursement rates. And so the third point that I'd like to make is that health insurance involves trade-offs. And so the point here is that, is that, so this is where it gets a little like fuzzy and I don't have the right answer here, is should providers be paid less so that lower cost insurance can be provided to low income groups in exchange for reduced provider choice? All right, so I, I think this would depend on whether reduced provider choice affects quality of care. So I did show that reduced provider choice uh, that narrow network plans tend to find uh, lower providers at, at times. So this is something we should pay attention to. Um, but if you look at Medicaid beneficiaries' response to surveys questions, only 11% um, indicate that they find, they find it difficult to, to find a doctor. And most low-income adults do have a low, do have a regular source of care. Um, so ultimately it depends on whether there is a willingness as a society to pay for equity and choice. So there's just less choice available if you're in Medicaid versus marketplace versus CSI. Um, but uh, uh, this has to trade off against the affordability of insurance and the availability of insurance programs for these segments of our population. But of course, as I mentioned at the beginning, there's still a large segment, almost uh, 20, almost 30 million people who remain uninsured. Um, so I'm gonna divert just a little bit more here to talk a bit about healthcare reform. Um, if we enter a Biden presidency. So here's his big statement about public option. He says, whether you're covered through your employer, buying uh, your insurance on your own, or going without coverage altogether, the Biden plan will give you the choice to purchase a public health insurance option like Medicare. As in Medicare, the public health option will reduce costs for patients by negotiating lower prices from hospitals and other healthcare providers. So offering public options involve offering more, more options that are public and do involve a trade-off with the uh, reimbursement that are offered to providers. Um, so the question ultimately becomes, as we think about more public programs um, to increase, uh, uh, to reduce uh, the uninsured um, and increase options for uh, the nation, we need to think, you know, the devil's ultimately in the details. What fraction of providers participate um, would participate? Um, and is there a trade-off between reducing costs and this issue of participation? Uh, and the other thing to think about is would this accomplish intended goals? Um, are, are high quality providers gonna find an option with private health insurance? Um, or is kind of the, the quality element um, not gonna be relevant here? These are kind of questions that, that remain to be answered as we think about rolling out um, the, the public option. Um, so just to kind of conclude that point, uh, connect it back to vaccines, the issue with provider networks is that uh, it, it can be messy and uh, to the degree it's messy, it affects our low income populations and the most vulnerable more heavily than it does um, uh, uh, those that, that, have, uh, are, that are, are better resourced. So now I'm gonna talk about uh, provider reimbursement. And so here I'm gonna just uh, quickly talk about uh, a study that led to a number of papers. It was an audit study that we did that we started in 2012 and it went for about five years. And uh, what we did is we um, called up about 30,000 physician offices and um, we, you know, we found, we got, I guess we ultimately called about a thousand within each of 10 states and the trained callers had a randomized script where they essentially, they asked for an appointment, 
said, I just moved into town. I need to get a doctor's appointment. And then we randomized whether they had private insurance or Medicaid and ultimately whether they had uh, uh, insurance in the ACA marketplace as well. And we recorded the extent to which they uh, were able, they were given an appointment and what date that appointment would be. Um, so uh, we did this, uh, we did three rounds, one before the ACA was implemented one in the middle of the ACA expansions in 2014, and then we went back in 2016. And so um, as part of this uh, study, which um, I'm not gonna go into all, all the papers, but I just wanna focus on one, which is focusing on this question of reimbursement. So uh, for two years, um, Medicaid, uh, if you saw a primary care doctor in Medicaid, the doctor got paid the same amount as if they saw a patient in Medicare. So across the 10 states we studied, it resulted in a pay bump, an increase in the reimbursement rate of up to $50 per visit in most of the states in our study. And so this kind of graphic, which must be impossible to see, um, just is really to show that there's a, this bump in this middle period of our three-year period. Um, and so in this study, we found that uh, more doctors participate when they're paid more. This shouldn't really be much of a surprise. Um, but uh, uh, the way we did this, I think, uh, was, was important. So uh, different states offer different Medicaid fees. So when everyone was set equal to the Medicare rate, in some states, um, rates went up a lot more than in others. So we were able to measure the percentage point change in appointment availability um, on average for each of the 10 states in our study and relate it to the dollar increase in their Medicaid fee rate. And so those are the orange dots. And then what happened in 2016 is that the, um, the Medicaid uh, fee, this was a two year deal. So the rates went back down. And so here, these blue dots, are what happens to appointment availability once the um, extra fee goes down. And I guess our study, our thought was that there'd be a kink in this curve. Once you have a relationship and you see how great it is to, to work with Medicaid patients, that when your a fee drops back down, you'll be sticky and maintain your relationships and, and stick with your patients. But we found pretty much a linear relationship all the way across, and that was somewhat uh, disappointing. Um, so, uh, I guess in relation here to uh, uh, health insurance as a, as a, the important point I'd like to make with respect to COVID-19 vaccines is that vaccines are really expensive to deliver. And there's a mandate for um, insurers to cover vaccines that's been around for a, a while, um, but they're not gonna change their reimbursement rate most likely. And especially if uh, the, the delivery is on, on the expensive side in terms of storage and just the sheer volume and the sheer speed with which this has to happen, it might not be in the uh, kind of economic interest of many providers to offer these services that the rates are being reimbursed for. And this is something that really has not been talked about to date. So access, if we rely on the healthcare system for, for vaccine administration may be difficult. So my alarm went off and I just have a couple more minutes. Um, so just to summarize, um, uh, my four points, um, what should our priorities be to ensure equitable allocation of COVID-19 vaccine? Number one, focus on public programs for those who fall outside of the insurance system. So I think I forgot to emphasize that point. Uh, this, this coverage is really for people with insurance and not those without. There's still 30 million without. Work on holes in the zero cost sharing provision of the ACA as the gray areas will sow distrust, reduce uptake. Um, but also do not rely on zero cost sharing to get adequate take up. We did not see as big a response to zero cost sharing as I think we would have expected. In particular, there is inequitable access for low income populations due to their high use of narrow networks. And delivering this vaccine will be expensive. Mandating uh, payers to cover costs will not mean that every provider will supply the vaccine. So I think, uh, you know, the bottom line here for me is it's a shame that we need to rely on our healthcare system for the delivery of this critical public health intervention. Um, it's so fragmented as it is, it, um, it'll inhibit equity and make herd immunity difficult. Distribution that circumvents the healthcare system may ultimately be the most equitable. Fire stations, places of worship, community centers, places of employment, Walmart, 
Um, also, federal dollars are critical. States are broke and cannot borrow. So these are all things we need to think about. And I'm just going to rush through because I want to talk a little bit about where I'm headed going, um, going forward. Uh, number one, I'm still thinking about uh, expanding health insurance as a facilitator in the areas that I'm focused on. One is uh, long-term care. There really is no insurance at the moment um, for uh, long-term care at home uh, with the growth of Alzheimer's disease. Um, this must be addressed. Uh, I now have a center, which I'll talk about in a center to help to ho hopefully work more on, on those issues. Employers must use their power as purchasers of health care to bring down prices and address community health. Uh, we should pay for telehealth care that works. Mental health care seems like the most high value area to get this right. And uh, four, provider networks in Medicaid must better be better managed by states. And the focus of my uh, latest project is to, uh, to think about this in, the, in relation to evidence-based treatment for opioid um, uh, use disorder. So I'm gonna talk very quickly in my last two slides about these new things that I'm starting. Uh, as of August, just last month, uh, Jennifer Wolf and I got awarded uh, along with our, our, our entire uh, team of um, directors of our cores. Uh, we are now, Hopkins is now one of the 11 centers um, for the demography and economics of aging. And we are one of the three that are focusing on Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. Our goals for our themes we're gonna focus on to advance population-based science and address ADRD care. And its economic consequences, we're gonna focus on identifying, quantifying the range of ADR, ADRD care needs and related economic consequences. And number two, we're gonna be examining how the organization, financing and delivery of services affects the accessibility, affordability, quality, and equity of ADRD care. And, uh, and finally, I just would like to uh, talk a little bit, uh, and I didn't leave enough time for the thing I'm spending the most time on, the Hopkins Business of Health Initiative. Uh, which I, I guess I've now appointed myself the director of this new initiative. Uh, HBI is a university initiative, group, initiative to integrate research, practice, and policy to improve performance of the nation's health system. It's a collaboration between the Bloomberg School of Public Health, School of Nursing, School of Medicine, the Cary Business School. We're kind of here in year one, and, and our focus is on telehealth and digital health, um, healthcare supply chain management, incentives for health and healthy behavior, big data and innovation, and uh, uh, Medicare Advantage and provider networks. And the theme really that kind of runs across all these uh, five different areas is that really thinking about um, that the way to address some of our greatest challenges and the ones we're gonna focus on is where business, policy, uh, public health, and uh, delivery can come together um, to work on solutions in a cooperative way. And so that's really uh, what we intend to do with this initiative. So I hope you stay tuned to find more. And I would just like to uh, end with some thank yous. It's all been part of my professional journey, my many mentors, um, a good many of them uh, from Penn, and in particular, just call uh, Mark Polly, uh, David Newmark, David Ash. Um, there's so many more, I didn't leave enough time to, to get through them all. So many of my supporters here at Hopkins, um, Sunil and Ellen, Colleen and uh, Trish Davidson, Alex Giannis, uh, Valerie Suslow, Paul Rothman, Denny Wirtz. Um, and I have a list here about 20 of uh, trainees and, and uh, other folks that I have worked with that have been part of the many papers that I put together and really leading the way on many of those papers. Um, and just a, a big shout out to all of them. And the last, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna have time to name them all, but um, just finally, um, there's my family, uh, thanks to them. This is kind of COVID stir crazy. Uh, this is what we do, we sit on the couch and give each other a hard time. Um, this is what I do during Zoom calls. So this picture was taken during one of my Zoom calls for this committee. <clears throat> so when I go off of Zoom, it's my daughter uh, wanting to like have me wear her art project. And that's my wife who I thank dearly for all of uh, my career um, support and, and home support. And here are my two uh, boys on their first day of school. We always take a picture of them walking out of the house. I made them walk out of the house so we could get a picture of them walking into the house. Um, so uh, with that, uh, here's uh, the three of them together. Um, 
Thank you very much. And I look forward to hearing your questions. Um, so maybe I'll turn it over to Aditi, who's the kind of manning the station. I'm going to turn off, if I can figure out how, uh, the, the uh, stop sharing. And um, I, I look forward to hearing questions. And please enter them into the Q&A or chat. Yeah, so we um, we started getting a few questions in. Um, there have been a couple focused on sort of some of your initial uh, papers and presentation on um, cost sharing and just sort of how cost sharing affects sort of different um, behaviors and how we can mitigate some of the uh, issues that you, you know, talked about when we think about cost sharing. And so one question came in about, you know, what you mentioned that people may still have uh, cost sharing for office visits if other things are done in addition to say a preventive screening or a vaccine or something. And so um, the question was how we can mitigate this risk when it comes in particular to COVID vaccination, how we can get people in like high deductible health plans or narrow network plans who may have been burned by out-of-pocket costs in the past, perhaps unexpected out-of-pocket costs how we can sort of address some of those concerns and mitigate those risks in order to achieve better vaccination rates. Yeah, I mean, I think this is really tough because um, a lot of it is, is um, like insurance is complicated, even for insurance companies. So just the wrong code um, could send things down the wrong path. Uh, kind of, it's not like all insurers are evildoers uh, that are trying to mess this up. Um, so most things should be covered, but there's just confusion. Um, of course, there are bad actors out there. And, um, uh, you know, so, so I guess the question is what, what can be done? Uh, one is that, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, messaging by insurers that they're, you know, out there to address these, these issues or, or with everybody that these can be, you know, there's like a process, just like if things don't work out, there's a fund to make sure it works out. So kind of like if a vaccine goes wrong, there's a fund to support you if things go wrong. There should be, you know, there could be a fund to support people if things go wrong. Um, you know, I think what, what I would like to see is uh, a federal appropriation that ensures zero cost sharing because it would take money. Um, and to, to think that every dollar is going to come from the insurer, I think, is, is naive, particularly for the uninsured. It's just there's just no mechanism for that. Um, but that same appropriation for the uninsured could also be a fund for people who, instead of going to your insurer to try to get everything addressed, you know, take it to some um, kind of place to get, you know, that, that would pay you up front, and then this process could try to reconcile claims. And I think sort of a, a related question about surprise billing is, that there's been sort of an increase in kind of news reporting, the kind that you quoted from uh, Sarah Cliff, but we've seen it from, you know, KHN and NPR and kind of surprise bill collections and ER bill collections that they've been doing about independent contractors and their role in the system that they might you know, serve as ER doctors or surgical assistants, and then later bill patients for those services, um, despite the like hospital being part of the network. And so, you know, the, uh, the person who asked the question was basically saying that these surprise bills seem kind of unavoidable um, without, you know, specifically sort of trying to figure out exactly who these individuals are it seems difficult to think about how to do that. And so do you think this is a growing issue? And again, what would be a policy solution for these kinds of surprise bills that may hmm. come from some of these independent contractors and some other parties involved in the so, I mean, I guess what, what's surprising is research suggests that, you know, surprise billing has been around a long time. It's just kind of come more to the attention of, of folks, which it was, a, it was a surprise to me that surprise billing uh, has not, you know, seen a significant uptake just because you hear so much about it. But it's a really difficult issue to, um, I mean, actually, it isn't that difficult an issue. There are bills that were almost passed that uh, would, you know, address it, I think, in reasonable ways. But the interests of the few that make so much money from surprise billing seems to win out, and this bill is yet to be passed. So, I mean, I think it's a question: is this something that can there's, can there be something done about it? I think there there's some great ideas to do something about it. We just got to get it passed. There's only a few that want that don't want to see it passed, but they seem to 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 you know win out every time. 
It's very frustrating. So more of a political, turning into a political problem. Uh, we have some uh, policy slash political questions coming in as well as you can imagine. So I won't, um, I won't make you answer each of them individually, but there's sort of some, there's sort of a range of questions about you know, what is the number one thing you'd like to see a potential Biden administration do to improve access for the underinsured or uninsured um, related questions about whether we can get out of this crazy system and um, sort of move towards universal health care, single payer, is that something that we should be thinking about? And how do you sort of think about those kinds of, um, sort of broader reform questions? Yeah, it's a great question. I knew I was going to get that question. Uh, you know, I think my view is, um, you know, no matter what we do, it's a mess. <laughs> you know, there's just like uh, every, you know, even that a policy that seems as straightforward as uh, zero cost sharing for um, preventive services, it's still a mess. Um, so, uh, you, know, the, you know, again, like the, the devil's in the details and I would be, you know, theoretically all for a universal insurance system. I don't know how we would get from here to there. Um, I think there's so many uh, things that we can do to make the current system work better. There's a million ideas that we know work that we just don't do. And uh, you know, that's where my focus is. And I try not to get involved in politics. Uh, I think that you know, the issue of uh, which direction to go more broadly speaking is a societal issue that will involve values and things that economists I think are not so great at. Um, and uh, you know, once, once we pick something, let's, let's make sure we knock it out of the park. Um, and I think there's a lot we can do now with our current system to make it work better. And, and that's where like my energy is currently focused. So I don't know. I hope that's a good non-answer. <laughs> so, um, I and I, I think another, you know, so the the question about sort of uninsurance and underinsurance, like how are you thinking about? You've talked a little bit about a public option. Do you have some sort of key takeaways from all of your work on insurance and trade-offs? The trade-offs involved in insurance design, when we think specifically about public option design and you know who we're trying to cover and like how much of that coverage gap we can address with this approach. I mean, I think for me, the most promising thing about the public option is that it offers some type of competition and leverage against the private system and ability to almost, you know, it's a lever. You can, if the private system's going out of whack, you can like tighten it, make rates, you know, you can, it, it gives the, the, you know, kind of a more a public uh, power within a, you know, largely private system within the private parts of our system. I don't know if you want to send the nozzle to 100 or to zero there, but it just gives you more ability to, to kind of calibrate along the way. So um, it's, not a, it's not a game changer. It's not a showstopper. I mean, healthcare is expensive. Someone pays for it. Even with this vaccine, zero cost sharing, it's expensive. It's going to make premiums go up. It's going to make healthcare even more unaffordable. <laughs> um, and so everything has a trade-off here. There's no, uh, you know, I think ultimately the challenge here is we set up a healthcare system when it was like 0.5% of our wages. Now it's 20% of our wages. It's expensive and there's no way around that. And, and so, um, and, and, it, and it, it, there's a lot of pain with a very expensive system. If we make it in, entirely public, um, that might you know, alleviate a lot of the inequity, inequities, um, but you know, it, has, it has its own set of trade-offs. To um, talk about a slightly different subject, so you mentioned um, paying for telehealth that works. So there are a couple of questions about telehealth, um, which I think could be summarized by this one, which asks, you know, given the significant uptick in telehealth utilization during this COVID period, do you think we're going to see equivalent levels of quality compared to in-person? How do we think about focusing telehealth in specific specialty areas or the sort of broader role for telehealth going forward? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, this is like an area of, of future research. Uh, and I'm in the DT, I hope you take, take this up. Uh, you know, I, the reason telehealth wasn't adequately reimbursed before is there's so, many op there's so many more opportunities for kind of taking advantage of the low frictions to seeing a provider um, that, uh, you know, that's kind of one area where things could go off the rails. But I think what's more likely is that uh, ultimately providers um, have a lot of 
say and what happens. And I think that there's higher, in general, higher quality of care, at least a perception by the providers that there's higher quality of care when you deliver it in person. And I think there's just, we're likely to go back to that uh, and, and telehealth will be an important uh, part of our delivery system that'll be much smaller and really will hopefully, in my mind, uh, focus on areas where access is, is really abysmal, like um, mental health care and uh, rural care as two uh, really important ones. So if it transforms those and sends a lot of the rest back to where it was before, I think I'd still call it a win. There's so many other places that I think there are wins, but I just think it's really difficult to find, um, to make sure we're, we're paying for the telehealth that's worth paying for uh, and paying for the in-person care that, that, that is, is preferable. It's gonna be really hard to get that exactly right. I think I we have uh, room for maybe one more question. Okay, let me see if I can prioritize one. Um, I guess to get back to your kind of initial framing on the um, COVID vaccine. So there are a couple of questions about, so there's one question about sort of pulling vaccine distribution outside of the insurance system, which you talked about some of the upsides, in it. And so this question asked, are there important downsides that we should consider? So that's one. And then a related one is about whether you can envision a scenario where there's sort of a very narrow um, vaccine with data that ACIP deems inadequate from a safety perspective, especially for um, populations that may not be sort of fully represented in trials. And how should we think about um, those kinds of um, sort of regulations and sort of safety requirements when we think about sort of scaling up a vaccine. Oh, well, one thing I learned from my time in, in Washington is try not to pretend to be an expert on something you're completely not an expert about. Um, so I think I'm going to pass on that uh, question around um, safety and efficacy. But, um, you know, kind of the broader issue of, um, you know, trying to go outside the system to deliver it. I mean, you know, we have trained professionals and we'd much rather have this delivered by trained professionals. So, um, you know, finding uh, that, that, that balance will be important. Uh, um, and, you know, I, you know, ultimately we're gonna need, you know, all hands on deck uh, and, and hopefully there's um, enough of an emphasis on finding non-traditional ways to deliver vaccines um, because that's really the only way it's gonna get in and it's gonna be delivered equitably. Um, and, and I think it's just going to require sufficient resourcing if all the resourcings within the healthcare system uh, were kind of stuck with a system that, that doesn't, doesn't really uh, get, you know, get allocation delivered in a, in a fair way. Um, so I think I'm stopping on time. Um, uh, but I, I'll just uh, take a moment to thank Aditi for running the show uh, there on the questions and, and thank the audience for, um, for a stimulating conversation uh, via uh, tele, you know, uh, technology here. Uh -huh. um, but thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dan. Fantastic talk. And Aditi, um, you're a master at um, uh, handling questions. Um, so thanks to both of you. Um, we're thrilled, uh, Dan, that you're part of the, our Bloomberg and um, our Hopkins uh, University uh, uh, family. And we wish you all the best of luck in all the work you're doing. Um, and I also, the pictures of your family were just um, terrific. And I was so glad you shared those with you. And I, I wish you many happy memories of this unplanned time um, that you have with your family. Um, it's one of those, the small um, plus sides of the, of the pandemic, I think. So best of luck and thank you again. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you, Ellen. All right. Enjoy your evening, everybody.